Let's all stand. Beautiful, uh, beautiful singing, great choir. Uh, isn't it great? Um, we need encouragement. What do you think? Do we need encouragement? Yes. We do. We need encouragement. Good dosage of encouragement. How about that? Would that be good? Yes. Yeah, so uh, before we start, uh, just turn to your neighbor and say, I need encouragement. <laughs> Go ahead. I need encouragement. Boy, I need encouragement. <laughs> We're in a good place for it. We need encouragement. We do. We need it. We came to church to hear from the Lord, and the Lord has words. Words. This summer we have the our summer sermons. We gave a card out, and the word today is assurance. So this is our study this morning. Summer building blocks, building your vocabulary, your spiritual vocabulary. And the word today is assurance. All right, so that'll be our theme this morning. And so, uh, one more time, uh, ready? Okay, Father, we pray, we know that you are God, you care for us, you care for us, teach us today this word and build us all up in it and send us out of here. We have been fed, that we have fed and received something from the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Thank you for each and every one. And teach us by your Spirit, we pray. By faith, we are, we are thankful. We are Spirit-led, Spirit-taught, and Spirit-filled people. We are thankful, we are thankful in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, you may be seated <clears throat> and follow the theme with me today. And um, we are going to turn, we're going to do a little diagram on our laptop. Uh, we're going to do, uh, read some definitions and have a great time here this morning. I read about the building of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and that in building the bridge, um, very high um, construction and also windy part of the country, also the Bay Area, a lot of wind, and men were falling off the bridges they were building, and they would fall to their deaths hitting the water. And so the construction company or whoever was in charge decided to invest a lot of money in a net, and they put a net there under the bridge and they found out that men did not fall off nearly as much as they did when there was no net there. From this story, I think we can understand something about the word assurance and its importance. Another word for assurance is confidence. I'll read a definition. The act of assuring or making a declaration in terms that furnish ground of confidence, as I trusted in his assurances, or the act of furnishing any ground 
of full confidence. It's used in Acts 17, where, whereof he hath given assurance to all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Christ being raised from the dead is a evidence of us being raised from the dead also, and that we have some assurance in this fact, in this truth, by the obvious resurrection. It also means firm persuasion, full confidence or trust, freedom from doubt, certain expectation, the utmost certainty. You know, when they were working on that bridge and, and the men there knew that if they fell, that was it then I'm sure the risk being higher made them uh, nervous and more insecure. But when they realized the net was there, perhaps they relaxed. They felt maybe more confident because there was the net there. As I shared this this morning in the early service, a man met me at the back of the room and he said, I want to tell you a story. I was on a U.S. aircraft carrier and there were nets around the outside of it and it went on a roll and we lost two men overboard and they landed in the nets and they were holding on inside. He said, we practiced when we went into the Navy, diving into them so that when we didn't use them, we knew they were there and we understood that our life would not be lost if we went overboard, but that, that we had some assurance when we walked and moved around on the ship. In a spiritual way, and in the word we read that it is God saying to us that he wants us to have confidence. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. That word confidence is also translated, there's a Greek word, it's a... Um, it, it's uh, relating, and I'll describe it to you, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of the things that we are hoping for. The word substance is hypostasis. It means an undergirding, an underpinning, or a foundation. What we see in this world is so movable and we also realize that people are also very changeable. Just look in your mirror and even have a relationship with somebody in this world and you can realize, we have realized how things can change. And if God put us here in this world and he would suggest to us that you can't have the guarantee I cannot promise you. It depends on you and your behavior. And don't make a slip. Don't fall. Don't be swept overboard or don't fall from the bridge. If you do, you perish. And you're lost. If that was the case, we'd be a bit nervous in our Christian life. We'd want to be, you know, hoping we would be able to make it, and that rooted in us. But what good, what kind of assurance do we have if it is grounded in us, our friendships, organization, government, economy, personality, the words of men? But isn't it amazing? That Jesus said it in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. And of all the Father has given me, I have lost none. In John 17, 
And he also said, no one can pluck you out of my hand. Nobody can pluck you out of my father's hand. If we would understand what is clearly written here in the scripture, then our life would be established with assurance. I was thinking of my marriage, and my wife was in the early service this morning, and I love it that we in our relationship have never brought into question the love that we have for each other. I go to bed, I just, you know, just, oh, it is so nice that, that our relationship has some assurance to it. And, and she, the way she talks to me, the way I talk to her, is on the grounds of something that we both consider to be very important. And it's really rooted in something deeper. And it is this, that God will never leave us or forsake us. That God has given us assurance regarding our fall. For when we fall, we will not be utterly cast down. If we stumble, actually a different way of saying it in Psalm 145, I stumble, but I will not utterly fall. What happens is that when we realize with God that underneath us are his everlasting arms, and we realize that if we fall, the relationship cannot be broken, that we will never be lost, that we have an assurance in the following aspects. Number one, our election is sure. First Thessalonians 1.4. Meaning God, we didn't call, we didn't, we did not choose God, more he chose us, John 15, verse 16. You've not chosen me, I have chosen you. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us. This is important. Because often we confuse objective truth with personal experience. We say, I have fallen, so I am lost. But God says, if I have saved you in saving you, I save you in healing, I heal you. Number two, I know that my Redeemer liveth, Job 19, verse 25. That's an assurance for us. The tomb is empty, and sometimes in evangelism, it's that simple. A tomb is empty. It can even be a greeting. Hey, hi. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Have you heard yet? The tomb is empty. Our Savior lives. Number three, our redemption, or I'm sorry, adoption. God has sent into our hearts the spirit of adoption. It is sure as adoption kind of sounds a little funny to us because we have birth in the scripture, born again, born again. But we also have another picture, another word that is used in the Bible, and it is adoption. It's when a, a, a boy, a young Jewish boy, reaches the age to have his bar mitzvah and he's fully mature at the age of 13. He has every right to all the inheritance. He has every right. He is an adult now. He has all legal rights. When you and I were born again, we were brought immediately to the place of mature inheritance. Immediately. Even though being newborn babes, we have received adoption status. You don't grow into it. It is given to us automatically by God, by his grace, through the work of Christ on the cross. And then we have assurance of salvation in Isaiah 12, 2, an assurance of an unchanging love, Romans 8, 38 and 39. His love won't change. Maybe the person sitting next to us, we change, but God's love never changes. 
Malachi 3, 6, he is not changing. With its election regarding us, he's not changing. We, we have said this before. I get saved, I go two years very well, and then I live a carnal life. Some believers think that, oh, God will take my name out of the book of life. Take my name out of the book of life for a couple of years, and then I, I come back and I, I, I accept Christ a second time, and he puts my name back in the book of life. I live for a couple more years, doing very well, and then I, I stumble and I fall again. And he takes my name out of the book of life. And then a couple of years later, I come back to Christ, and I believe and trust in him, and then he puts my name back in the book of life. Is that how it works? Is God confused about me? Is he putting my name in and out? Does he have a big eraser? Is he taking my name out of the book and putting it back in, or how does it work? He knows the end from the beginning. He knows it all. He is God. And when he says that our name is in the book of life, and Jesus said it in Luke chapter 10 to the disciples, rejoice not that the demons, you have authority over the demons, but rejoice in this, that your name is in the book of life. You might say, well, that's the disciples, that's the 11. And we would say, Jesus said, there are others of this flock that you have given to me, Father, John chapter 17. And of all that the Father has given me, I have lost none. I want to say that I don't live a carnal life because the assurances and the guarantees that I have regarding his nature are more interesting than a sinful lifestyle. A sinful lifestyle does not appeal to me. If I can find power, peace, love, mercy, motivation, and the assurance that is objectively in the scripture and then subjectively it grows in you, and we'll look at that in a minute. Subjectively, assurance grows in you. First John chapter 2 and verse 5, and First John chapter 4, verse 13. When we keep his word, when we live by faith, and that not by law, not by my flesh, but by the Spirit, when we walk by faith and we have the Holy Spirit bearing witness, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, a growing sense of confidence that God is my Father and his, the relationship that we have with him is very sure. Okay, so we have the importance of assurance. In our human heart, we are fundamentally made to have this assurance. If I live with my wife, and my wife was always suggesting to me divorce, it doesn't make my married life very comfortable. The D word, the D word, what's wrong? That's not at making my marriage a very sure thing. I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by that. That's uh, upsetting to me. And I look for her love or response, and I love her, and, and, and the same works the other way. If, I'm not, if I am not reassuring her of a love that does not fail, then our marriage is, is, is ready, it's moving. My marriage is moving, it is on moving ground. And so my heart is not made for that insecurity, just like the men up on a bridge are not made for living in insecurity and a lack of assurance. I want to know if I fail, will God fail me? If I stumble, will I fall? Will I ever be lost? Is there anything that I would ever do that would change his love for me? We are made to know this. We want to know this. That's why it's written. It says, First John chapter 5, verse 13, it says, These things were written so you may know you have eternal life. 
Did you hear that? This is written so we would know. Because God knows we're made for this. We're made to be loved. We're made to be held up. We're made to be caught if we fall. Swept overboard. We're made to be in a place of security, a resting place. Every child in this church that goes home, they want to know where their little bed is, where their little light is, where their little teddy bear is, and they don't want it to be moving all the time. And they don't want their world to be shaken every day. They want the sun to come up and go down the way it's supposed to every day. We're made for this. And in our faith, it's very important that we would have assurances that the hand, the mind of God, the hand of God is there for us. <clears throat> we know also that the devil realizes this about us, and he would like our world to be moving. He would like to say, there's two things that he would like to do. He would like to say, you cannot trust anyone. You cannot trust God. There is no God. You cannot trust anyone or anything. There are no assurances here. When you have done that in the past, you have gotten hurt. And I want you to know there is no such thing. The second thing he wants to do is to have people build their life on false assurances, false concepts, things to let you down sooner or later. He'd love us to be loved, 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 and then dropped like a ton of bricks. And when you are crashed, he would like to mock us for having trusted Beware of the false prophets, Jesus said. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It's a false system. It will not hold you up. It will not take care of you. It will not carry you through your trial. It will, it will fail you. It is not truth. You think of all the religious people that are building their life on a false concept when there is no real substance there, there is only another man. It's a man teaching another man, and men only living as men, and there is no God there. And that is heartbreaking. Christ spoke to those people often in the New Testament, and he was very tough with them because he wanted to shake their world, and he wanted to say to them, you must come to me. All that have come before me are thieves and robbers. You must come to me. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the porter. I, I, the Holy Spirit is the porter, but uh, you will go in and out. And if you hear my voice, then, then uh, you will come to me. And I know my sheep, and I call them by name. And of all the Father has given me, I will not lose any. And you cannot take that you, them cannot be taken out of my hand nor out of my Father's hand. So what have we found? We have found two elements in our assurances, and I want to show them to you. The first element is objective. First John, please turn there, chapter 5. We quoted it, but I'd like you to read it. <clears throat> In our faith, we have an objective foundation. What do I mean by objective? <clears throat> Let's write it down here. <clears throat> Assurances. Are you sure... I was in the hospital one time for a week, uh, really sick, um, curled up in a ball, very sick, and uh, uh, without any strength, and not able to think really, had a real powerful headache, um, and uh, groaning every once in a while, and I, 
I was uh, in, in, you know, I was sick, and I love this teaching that we're sharing this morning. There'll be a time in your life when almost you're falling through the air, and you just say, oh, God, <laughs> are, you, are you there? And you, you're caught swinging in the net, and in your mind, you understand these truths that we're sharing. It is true. There is what is called, a lawyer told me one time, this idea, and I, I thought it was great, apparent authority, apparent authority, and then there is real authority, or the reality There's somebody maybe that looks like they are in authority, but they aren't. It seems, but they're not. It's apparent authority. There's also, we could say, apparent reality. And then there is the reality. The hypostasis, the underpinning of the world we live in, is not always obvious to us. There are things about our life that we will find um, on one level, but, but we want to know more. We want to know more. Lord, if I am falling, if I am falling, if I don't believe, if I am in trouble, if I have sinned, if I have failed you, if I have broken your law, if I am sick, very sick, lying in a hospital, if I am on the shadow of death, in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, God, shall comfort me. You will lead me in the valley of the shadow of death. This is the Life of faith with objective, this is objective truth, ob objective meaning. Whether you feel it or not, it is true. Whether you experience it or not, it is true. It is simply true because it is written. This is why it says in John, 1 John 5.13, read it with me. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. doesn't say, I hope you are feeling today that you have eternal life. Because when I was in that hospital, I didn't feel at all anything spiritual. I didn't have a thought. I didn't have a thought about God, only back way deep in my mind. I understood this, that the assurance that I have in the nature and the character of God was very comforting to me. To know that it is God that has saved us, it is God that keeps us, it is God that leads us, and it is based on objective, this is the truth of the Bible. When you read the Bible, read it to yourself that it is speaking to you. These things are written so you may know you have eternal life. And then number two is subjective. And this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, if I am keeping his word, keeping his word, there is a, a blessing of great, great value in keeping his word. When we live by faith in the word, what the Bible is saying, the word, the Bible, then what happens, verse 5, in him verily is the love of God perfected. It comes full circle. Love from God in us, then the love goes out to others. Let me, let's, let's look at it this way. Love of God perfected. Here, here's a good example. I think you'll follow this with me. Jesus loved Judas. Watch. Jesus loved Judas. And then what happened to that love? Judas received, Judas is loved, and what does he do? It's like he pours it on the ground. It's gone. Jesus loves Judas, and it's gone. Now, 
Jesus loves Peter. He loves Peter. Peter denied him, but he loves Peter. He loves Peter, and where's the love? Love goes back to Jesus. Which is the greater love here? Loving Judas, that does not come back, or loving Peter, that comes back? The Trinity is this. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. It's like a circle. I love you, you love me. I love you, you love me. We live in love. This is a love and mind. And, and there's assurance in it. I will never fail you. I will never leave you. I'll never let you down. All my promises are yea and amen. I am God. Do you understand? I brought you into the Trinity. And that I love you as I love my son. And the same love that I've loved my son with is the same love that you love me with. We have an assurance of that. We say, it is so. I do have eternal life. Not only the Bible says so, but the Holy Spirit is saying so in my heart. I am being loved. Now watch. In a relationship, you love your wife. Or you love your wife and the love goes on the ground. And she doesn't like you. And she's not going to talk to you. And she just is maybe stubborn, digging her heels in. Not going anywhere, but you love her. And you love her, and that's the calling of the man, of a man, a believer. It says men ought, men ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church. But a good tip for ladies is love them back. Receive love and return it. Give it back. We have a hard time with our children sometimes because we love our kids and we find that they don't care, maybe. Or it goes on the ground, so to speak. I use the on the ground is um, used about David in uh, uh, 1 Samuel. And my, my life is as water poured out on the ground. It's gone. But we don't give up on our kids. We love them. Same with a woman and her husband. She loves her husband, and, and he, he, he should recognize that. He should recognize that this woman is making an effort, that she's caring, that she wants God's will, that she's living in, in Christ and living in love. And the man could also say, you know, not interested, dig in his heels, and, and it's poured out on the ground. But look at verse 5 again in this context. Verse 5, it says, But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. This means it's coming around full circle. And you're living in the benefit of being loved and loving. Hereby know we that we are in him. How do you know it? By your experience. You are knowing that we are in him, and it is subjective. And so now you have assurance with two aspects to it. You have objective assurance, the Bible is saying, and then you have subjective, the Holy Spirit is saying that you are a child of God, and God will never leave you and never forsake you. And therefore, you kind of relax in the relationship and then you also look and you understand that people all around me are hungering for a relationship based on the truth and having assurances even in our relationships where we are saying when we make our wedding vows, I will love you in sickness and in health, in poverty and prosperity until death do we part. So we don't use that D word in our marriage at home when you are angry. You don't suggest it because you understand the value of a love that is from God shared to you. And that love shared to me makes me relax and understand that at the very heart of our life are relationships that simply are connected with amazing assurances. Our children need to know we love them, and we won't stop. Our friends need to know it, and they do. 
And the body of Christ is simply is here. And it's a great way to live our life. Because on the surface, there are those things that are maybe apparent. But I would like to know those things that will never move. Maybe people will come and go. People might have troubles. We, we are not perfect people. There is failure. But there's failure in life. So we'll get our eyes onto that, which is hypostasis, the underpinning of all reality. That we'll get our eyes on God and the spirit of God and the mind of God. And then we'll live there. And then on the basis of that, then we are living our life like Jesus said. If a man hears my word and does what I say, he's like a man building his life, his house upon a rock. And when the storms come, it will not be moved. Isn't it true? <clears throat> One last part. This word used in an absolute sense, means to be convinced. I am persuaded. I am convinced. Hebrews 6, 9. We are persuaded that neither death nor life, principalities or powers. I am persuaded. 2 Timothy 1, 12. I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him. This persuasion in the mind and subconscious part of our minds is so healthy for us. I believe we can go through anything when we know God as a faithful God and as a loving God and as a forgiving God. And then I believe also that when that goes into our hearts and we understand what is normal, what is normal spiritually speaking, and we're able to build our lives in something that is a lot deeper than ourselves. But it's his nature, his character revealed in us and through us in a very shaky world. Oh, death. Oh, death. Can I talk to you? Come on, death. Come on over here. I want to talk to you, death. Death, where is your sting? And oh, grave, where is your victory? And they would, death would say, how can you talk to me like that? How can you talk to me like that? And we say, hypostasis, underneath the reality, not the apparent one, but the one that is actually in God. I have died already, Mr. Death. I have already died. And I have passed already from death unto life. And so you are only there for me to see as a a parent, but the assurance that I have, the foundation, the confidence and the persuasion is from God. And it is, I will pass through the, listen, the valley of the, what? Shadow of death. What is a shadow? A shadow, the shadow. The shadow of an automobile, the shadow of a house, the shadow of a tree. It is not the reality. The shadow is just a shadow. And death for us is only a shadow. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And on the basis of this great assurance, we live a different life. And we're up high in the girders, high on the Golden Gate Bridge. Walking along up there, there's something different about us because we have an assurance, a testimony, an orientation, not with the apparent reality, but God's reality in a movable, shakable world that gives you an advantage to have a testimony. When you go golfing, Hey, Eddie, how you doing? The tomb is empty, Ed. The tomb is empty. When you go into work and you see the security guard, Hey, Mikey, hey, Mikey, the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Come out out to our church and sit down and enjoy yourself and hear a message about the real world, the one that Christ made and the one that we live in.
Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Would you say in your heart this morning to Christ, in your heart say, if you've never done it before, this is the day for you. On the internet, say, I believe in Jesus Christ in my heart. On the internet, say it. In China, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, any part of the world, say it. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in you. Here in the auditorium, please say it. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I put my trust in you. There is none like you. I accept you and believe in you. I put my trust in you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you raise your hand if you said the prayer this morning here in the auditorium, anyone at all? All right, amen. Would you stand and sing the closing song and we'll dismiss you.